please. Mm -hmm. That's great. Very exciting. All right. Um, first of all, I'd like to welcome everybody. My name is Mary Jane Burke. I'm the county superintendent in Marin and wanted to let you know we'll be we will be recording this session. So it'll be available um, at our website in approximately 24 hours. And we are also uh, providing live translation. Uh, so that will be available. So this will be available um, in Spanish. And Marta, would you mind uh, just translating what I've said so far? Uh, she won't be able to do that, Mary Jane, because she's already translating in the Spanish channel. Oh, okay. She, oh, she's already there. Okay, so they'll, so our uh, Spanish speakers will be able to get it through that. So um, let me first uh, say Happy New Year to everyone. Um, hi, Marta. Say Happy New Year to everyone, and to thank you for joining us here. Um, it is our privilege uh, to have, um, I would say, the two most esteemed um, educators in our state uh, with us to provide us some insight into uh, what's happening um, in Sacramento right now and how we might plan for um, the challenges that will be coming forward uh, related to this new budget. So I'd like to introduce first uh, Brooks Allen. Um, and Brooks is um, a well-known attorney, worked for the ACLU. He's known uh, for his incredible work um, as the ACLU attorney related to the Williams lawsuit. And for all of you that work in our school districts, you're well aware, aware of the steps we take each year to ensure that students in our state have access to the materials, books, um, and appropriate sites that they need. Um, he uh, worked for the State Board of Education as a legal advisor. Um, instrumental in the development of what we refer to as LCFF, um, graduate of Stanford uh, and Yale Law School, Stanford and then Yale Law School. Um, most recently, uh, he uh, supported the CCEE, the California a Collaborative for Excellence in Education, and we had uh, the privilege of having him actually work here um, at the County Office of Education here in Marin County. And now he is um, the advisor to the governor our, uh, of our state related to all things education. So Brooks Allen, thank you very much for, for joining us. We're very happy to have you. And next, um, the amazing Mike Fine. Uh, Mike is the chief executive officer for the Fiscal Crisis Management Assistance Team. Uh, we know that as FICMAT, served um, has served also as the Chief Administrative Officer for FICMAT. And prior uh, to joining FICMAT, he has a, a very long um, career um, in the area of finance, uh, Director of Fiscal Services for Newport Mesa School District, Assistant Superintendent uh, for Riverside School District, Deputy Superintendent uh, for 13 years. Um, Mike um, is a finance guy for sure, but he, um, in everything he does, makes sure that he focuses on students, um, what they need, uh, and ensuring that as he's thinking about issues, he's putting kids first. Um, and one of the things that helps him be reminded of that is he is married to an esteemed teacher, and that keeps him, I would say, honest. So uh, with that, I'm not sure who will I uh, turn this to first, Brooks, to you or to Mike? I believe it will be to Mike. Okay. One other thing I want to add, if you can be sure to put any questions in the chat, we did uh, receive some questions prior that we will uh, be making sure that we ask. But um, in addition, we will definitely be looking at the end of this to um, any questions that have been posted in the chat. Now I'm seeing that Mike Fine is not there. Uh, well, I, Mary Jane, I just I just got word from Mike. He is um, reconnecting. Um, I think we lost his uh, we lost his visual. Okay. okay, great. So Brooks, why don't you start by telling us how much you miss Marin County and how do you like your new job? <laughs> <laughs> There's not much going on, right? It's, it's very quiet. No, Mary Jane, it's, it's fantastic to be back uh, with you, Serena, and the entire team. Um, and of course, many of the folks who I, I know I've really enjoyed being able to see at these annual sessions in person, uh, but at least being able to do this virtually. So it um, feels like coming home in many ways. And uh, 
we've spent a long day with the Senate uh, discussing many of these issues, at least with respect to the early action pieces of the budget right now. So uh, yeah, looking forward to the conversation. Okay, great. All right, here comes Mike Fine. Yeah, I apologize. No, I'm... that's okay, Mike, welcome. I gave you a very a nice introduction and I said the reason you stay so honest is because you're married to a teacher. Uh, there's a lot of truth to that. <laughs> Probably honesty so, may or may not, in, she may not influence honesty, but certainly my, my focus of what's important, uh, she, she keeps me uh, focused and I have, as does Brooks, firsthand experience here between my wife and our son as teachers going through uh, the last 11 months. So I'm still not able to get my video to work. So, so Mike, how about if we, on our end, we'll share your slides? Well, I think I can share my slides. Trina, give oh, me one okay. second. Very it good. is just my camera for some reason seems to not want to turn on. So if you can let me know that you are seeing my slides. All good. They're they're much nicer looking than I am anyway. So having my camera not work will, will actually work just fine. So thank you guys. Uh, I think uh, I rejoined just as Brooks was commenting that uh, we, for the last several years, we've had the truly the pleasure to do this uh, um, and do it in person there in Marin. And uh, it's, it's certainly um, always been a highlight. I do a bunch of these in January and February to a bunch of different audiences. And um, so clearly I'm having trouble. Can, Tarina, can you just confirm I'm still broadcasting? You are, you are still broadcasting and you are on slide one. Okay, because Zoom just went completely dark uh, on my screen. Um, but uh, certainly uh, among the many that do, this has always been a highlight uh, uh, to be in Marin with, with all of you and to join with Brooks uh, uh, to do this. So Brooks and I have this dark, uh, deep, secret about this event after we did it the first time um mary jane uh, about a week later in in our mail arrived uh brooks is shaking his head because he can't believe i'm gonna admit this in public mary jane sent brooks and i pink tutus so that in the future we're on stage together we at least had matching outfits so i just wanted you to know that finally this year we decided to fully embrace the pink tutus. We both had ours cleaned and pressed this morning at the cleaners and we have them on. Um, however, because of the zoom limitations, we can only show you mid chest and above. It doesn't allow us to um, show you our, our pink tutus. So with that, let's get to uh, the budget. So, um, and I'm going to walk through uh, many of these points and Brooks is going to uh, join join in and, and provide a little um, uh, uh, perspective uh, from uh, the administration and and uh, and broader perspectives, especially on some of these issues that have already had uh, the hearing processes started, including a long, as Brooks alluded to earlier, a, a long hearing this morning um, on on one of the proposals. Uh, so just a quick overview of. Um, of what we're looking at, certainly a, a very different but governor's budget proposal than we anticipated even four months ago. Uh, we began to, uh, actually since really July 1, we've been watching data very carefully um, and we saw it begin immediately to trend uh, different than what the adopted budget had anticipated. Uh, and we kept kind of holding our breath. Well, July's data isn't gonna hold. When we get to August, we'll really start to see the impact of the pandemic when we get to September, when we get to October. Uh, but by mid-November, when the Legislative Analyst Office issued their outlook uh, for the next couple of years, um, it became apparent that at least for part of the year, we were clearly going to outpace uh, what the adopted state budget looked like. Um, and in fact, that trend has continued through uh, data through December. And uh, there doesn't appear to be um, a whole lot of new data here in, in early January uh, that tells us that trend uh, is changing. And so uh, to their credit, the administration in proposing their budget um, has acknowledged that, uh, that we, 
we have probably neither a V recovery where we went down suddenly and went right back up in recovery or a U where we kind of set at the bottom a little bit and then recovered. Uh, what we were all worried about was an L recovery where we dropped in the spring and, and kind of set there at the bottom for a while. The reality is I think most of us describe the recovery that we're in right now as a K recovery. And uh, the backbone is our, of the K is our, our current point, um, kind of the pandemic um, and its effects here in California and on our economy um, and the upward angle of the K, the upward leg of the K, uh, we commonly refer to as Wall Street and the lower leg, uh, uh, leg of the K as Main Street. And what it really is telling us is we have a, a disparate impact um, of the pandemic on our communities. But one of the areas where we are not experiencing, um, uh, and, and because of that disparate impact, uh, where it's uh, impacted um, folks with wealth differently than folks without wealth um, results in uh, state revenues. Um, almost, uh, I think it, the metric is actually about 5% of the taxpayers uh, paying into personal income tax here in California contribute about 50% of the tax revenue. Um, and so um, those uh, high earners obviously are, are uh, continuing for the most part uh, to do well under the pandemic from a, from a purely economic standpoint. Um, and we're seeing that result in revenue. So the administration acknowledges a revised three-year revenue forecast that actually some 57 million higher. When we talk about three years, we're always looking at three-year window. In this case, we're looking at last year uh, for which the books uh, still need to be uh, fully closed in um, all data accounted for, um, because no matter when you pay taxes, uh, whether those are sales and use tax or personal income tax or corporate tax, they're actually scored in the year that they're attributable to. So we still have some taxes attributable last year that we need to account for the current year and then the budget year. That's the three-year window that we're talking about. We'll take a look at that more in just a minute. This is really meant to be at glance. Current and budget year contributions to the school rainy day fund, uh, we'll talk about extensively. We'll um, eat up about 3 billion of that increase. It's a matter of formulas and we'll go into that in just a second. Proposition 98, and remember that Proposition 98 from 1988 um, uh, is uh, the standard that dictates um, how much of the state uh, revenue um, goes to K-14, so K-12 plus our community college partners. Um, that's growing uh, substantially uh, from the number that was adopted in, uh, uh, in June. Um, we do have a cost of living adjustment. We'll talk about it a little bit more. Uh, it is a, a split cost of living adjustment, but for um, the majority of our revenues, which are driven by the local control funding formula, both at school districts and charter schools and at county offices of ed, we'll receive a proposed 3.84 COLA, and we'll talk about that more in just a second. The governor continues his focus on special ed, specifically early intervention um, with our special needs students and uh, increases the investment that he started uh, when he first came into office by another 300 million. You're all familiar with the K-12 apportionment deferrals, uh, which was a budget mitigation measure um, uh, implemented in June uh, with the adopted budget. Um, and the governor does propose to buy down the bulk of those uh, next year, uh, not quite all of them. And we'll talk about that a little bit more as well. We have some proposals in Prop 98 for current year expenditures, and we'll go into some of those in depth because those um, are uh, what we call early action considerations by the legislature, so they won't wait till the June timeframe uh, as the normal budget process uh, uh, works, or, or the normal budget works its way through its process, but um, the governor has asked for um, uh, immediate uh, action in one of the cases, an early um, action in another case, so we'll explore those. And then there are numerous uh, one-time provisions, uh, Proposition 98 uh, investments, uh, well over a billion dollars in this budget as well. 
So let's take a little deeper dive on revenues. As I mentioned, the three-year period 1920 through 2021 is what we're looking at. This is a 57 billion increase over what was estimated uh, in June, uh, which for all intents was really used in June. It was estimated in uh, late April and May. Um, and so the, the administration, as does everybody acknowledges that we simply, um, we got it wrong on what the pandemic's impact would be to state revenues. Uh, these are really driven by the three big uh, revenue sources uh, that fund schools uh, through the state. Um, and that is personal income tax and capital gains is a significant piece of that. Um, and uh, then uh, sales and use taxes and then corporate and insurance taxes. Those three big taxes um, are what provide the state the bulk of the funds that are used in Proposition 98. Locally, obviously, we have property taxes that um, are uh, a factor uh, for school districts as well. Concerns continue to be raised, though, about the impact of the pandemic on the revenues. As I indicated in my opening remarks, uh, data even through early January here continues to trend uh, well above what the projection was um, and on track for this 57, acknowledging this $57 billion um, shift. Um, however, we also know that many of those estimates uh, were performed in early December before we really felt the impact of the most recent surge, both on the economy, on health care, and on our families and communities. Um, and so there's still some soft spots in all of this. Certainly that shift uh, with an increase of $57 billion, some of that is in hand, but much of that is still forecasted and is not in the state treasury. It's not been collected yet. So uh, a piece of that's known, certainly the, the piece related to 1920, uh, we are more familiar with that each day that goes by. Um, we're halfway through 21 to 20, I'm sorry, we're halfway through 2021 uh, fiscal year. And so we know part of that, but still part of the year is an estimate. And then certainly all of 21, 22 is an estimate. Um, what we do know and this isn't a revenue conversation, but uh, what we do know that the pandemic has an impact on us is while it may be skipping over the revenue um, impact, it does have an impact um, on uh, expenditures, on demand for services uh, relative to state services, um, both in school districts um, and in um, uh, state contributions to a whole variety of uh, social programs and um, um, other uh, public health and public safety types of programs. So there's a, a huge demand on the non-school side of the state budget, the non-Proposition 98 side of state budget, if you will, for increase um, services. And certainly among those uh, uh, increases that are not pandemic is also continued investment in the state's ability to respond to wildfires um, and to assist communities that have been impacted by wildfires. Wild uh, revenue growth over the next several years is forecasted at what we think to be a fairly reasonable 2.6% average year over year growth. And so in the current forecast out uh, over the forecast period, which goes beyond 21-22, uh, we think that, that that year over year revenue growth um, is, is reasonable. So reserves, I mentioned this in my opening slide, and this is the state's rainy day fund specifically for school. We call the public school system stabilization account. Um, there are really two rainy day funds. There's a state rainy day fund, and then there's a rainy day fund for school districts specifically. Uh, one of the budget mitigation measures that was adopted this past spring uh, for the current year was to uh, use all of the funds on hand in the school rainy day fund. So we depleted that fund down to zero. Um, the, the requirement to make contributions to the fund are driven by revenue and specifically a subcomponent of revenue has a great influence on those contributions and that's capital gains. So there's some thresholds in law that when capital gains exceed uh, those thresholds, then that drives in part the contributions that are required to be made to the school's rainy day fund. And so we can see that already with the um, economic recovery or the lack of, a, of an adverse impact on state revenues in the current year, uh, that we're going to have a requirement to make a contribution in the current year, estimated at about $750 million. And then in the budget year, 
um, uh, almost $2.2 billion. Um, again, these are a function of formulas in existing law. Um, while everybody can say, and, and certainly um, uh, would argue that having some funds in this rainy day, uh, having deposits in this rainy day fund is a positive thing. It certainly helped uh, a little bit with the cuts that otherwise would have come to education in this current year. Um, the reality is though that it takes money kind of right off the top um, of Proposition 98 to make a deposit into this fund as opposed to allocating those funds out through programs um, to school districts. So there's certainly um, two sides to the story, uh, but that, uh, that is uh, Proposition 2. Um, and so uh, not, uh, not something that the legislature um, can change. It would require a change uh, through the initiative process, a vote of the people. Um, What's important though, and you've all heard this discussion for the last several years, actually since this provision was put in place, that when the rainy day fund deposits get to be a certain level at the state, basically um, in excess of um, uh, 3% um, of uh, Proposition 98, then there's a cap imposed in, that, in law on school districts' local reserves, both their assigned and unassigned local reserves. And so uh, while we've talked about it a lot over the last, uh, I've forgotten time frame here, but five years roughly, um, uh, we've not really worried about it because it was never triggered. Um, however, the uh, assumption right now, if there's 3 billion in the rainy day fund at the end of uh, 21 22 that that 10 percent cap on local school district funds uh, would be triggered for 22 23. Um, again it applies to assigned and unassigned reserves. Uh, there are um, numerous uh, workarounds available to local uh, educational agencies and and one of them is to apply to your county superintendent for a waiver. Uh, the county superintendent has the authority to waive um, that cap provision um, for two out of three consecutive years. So they can't do it every year, um, but they can, they can do it for a period of time. It is possible uh, that the formula uh, would work in such a way that we would have the cap imposed in one year and then the cap would not be imposed in another year. So it's not always an, a need to have the county superintendent waive it for two consecutive years. But let me also put this all in perspective. There's uh, just over 1,100 school districts across the state. This does not apply, by the way, to charter schools or to county offices. It also, of those 1,100 plus school districts, it does not apply to basic aid school districts or community funded districts, of which there are several in Marin County. Um, and it doesn't apply to small school districts, those that are 2,500 ADA or lower. So by the time you take out all the exceptions, uh, we believe that this impacts roughly 250 districts and of those 250, the legislative analyst office estimates that about 150 of those 250 uh, probably have uh, signed and unassigned reserves in excess of 10%. So it's a relatively small group of districts that would be impacted um, in the big scheme of things. However, the impact on them uh, could be fairly significant. And so uh, that's clearly uh, data that we'll pay close attention to as, as, we, as we move forward. So we keep mentioning Proposition 98, that overarching uh, 1990, uh, 1988 initiative um, that uh, was designed to address uh, school funding, uh, the state's contribution to school funding um, in California. Um, there are, Proposition 98 is highly technical let me simplify it by saying the amount of funds that the state is obligated to provide what we call the minimum guarantee is driven by three different sets of formulas called tests, test one, test two, test three. And I won't get into the technical aspects of test two and three because that's not the environment that we're in right now. Uh, for the current year and estimated for the budget year for July 1, we'll be in a test one environment. And really what that says for school districts and community colleges, and I'm being overly simple here, is it says that of those three big taxes, a personal income tax, sales and use tax, and corporate insurance taxes, 
um, schools and community colleges will receive 38% of each dollar collected. So if the state collects a dollar, um, schools are guaranteed 38 cents of that. Uh, test two is more complicated and, and looks at a number of other factors, not just a straight percentage. Test three, um, likewise, uh, takes into consideration values that are both in test one and test two and does some comparisons. Um, and so um, what's important here is to know that we're in an environment that despite our change in uh, enrollment or ADA um, on other changes in test one, it's fairly simple that once the state forecasts those revenue components that we're able to calculate the Proposition 98 uh, minimum guarantee. Uh, the governor sets aside within Proposition 98 $2 billion to fund a comp what I'm calling a compounded COLA of 3.89% for local control funding formula. As I mentioned earlier, this is for LCFF at districts, charter schools, and county offices. There was confusion in the early days of the budget earlier this month on whether this applied to county offices or not. Uh, let me explain what I mean by compounded and, and because not everybody's, uh, I think, appreciating uh, both what the governor and the Department of Finance proposed, um, but also the mechanics of it. So we know that last year's statutory COLA, uh, I'm sorry, the statutory co COLA computed last year for this year, for the current fiscal year that we're in 2021, was 2.31%. And you'll remember that the final budget deal did not fund the statutory COLA. So the COLA in essence was funded at zero. Um, what the administration is doing is acknowledging that had their revenue estimates uh, been more, um, uh, not sure what to call it, more accurate for lack of a better term um, with respect to what how the pandemic really would have played out. And you can all appreciate that they were doing this in April and May. We didn't, none of us understood how the pandemic would play out and its impact on our economy. Uh, but had there, had the pandemic not occurred, maybe is a better way to say it, that they would have funded the 2.31%. So of the 3.84, they're starting with this year's COLA of 2.31. Now they're not going to pay it to us retroactive. So while 2.31 is related to 2021, it won't take effect till July 1 of 21. So it's, it's a perspective number. They're not going back retroactive. They're just going back and capturing the data of what would have been paid. To that, they're, at, they're estimating the statutory COLA for 21-22 at 1.5%. And they're adding those two, but they're layering it in such a way that they add the 2.31 to LCFF, then they add the 1.5. So that's where we come up with the compounding. It's like compounded interest, right? They're compounding the COLA. It's not just 2.31 plus 1.5. They, they're actually um, adding it, redoing the calculation, and then adding the new one. Why is the 1.5 estimated? It's because it's a number based on the 12 months ending March 31st. Um, it is a national number. It's a federal number issued by the um, uh, Department of Commerce. Um, and while we have a lot of data for nine of those 12 months, there's two important pieces of data that are still coming uh, that helps nail down what that statutory COLA actually will be. One of those pieces of data will be available here in the next week, uh, which is the third quarter actual data. And then the other piece of data will be available in April, which is the fourth quarter um, uh, actual data relative to this. And so in part, this is why we have a May revised. It's so the state can acknowledge what the actual statutory COLA is. And so kudos really to the administration and Department of Finance and their approach here to the COLA. Um, as they um, look at funding LCFF. Uh, there's a, is a COLA for a, the few categorical programs that are left. Uh, it would be at the statutory COLA of 1.5% uh, for um, uh, just uh, uh, those categorical programs. So they don't use the compounded COLA um, uh, for the categoricals. The largest categorical that program that's left is special education. Um, and so special ed would have the 1.5. I've already mentioned the COLA for county offices. I kind of lumped it up there in the LCFF, but there's uh, uh, roughly another $10 million to fund the compounded COLA uh, for county offices of ed. Also within Proposition 98, and, the, and you're gonna hear me talk more about this, 
uh, but I put it under the heading Prop 98 because there are some non-Prop 98 components to the education budget. Uh, very few, uh, but there are some. Uh, and so the governor, uh, as we'll go into detail in just a second, proposes to continue um, existing investments and to add to those existing investments uh, in special ed uh, additional funding grant um, for early intervention. There's another $20 billion of one-time investments uh, in a variety of things, and we'll talk about most of these in just a second. The PSSA, PSSSA contributions, I never get the final S, um, I just talked about. That's the rainy day fund, the public school system stabilization account. Um, and so we'll talk about more of these, or we'll talk more about each of these in just a second. So again, on special ed, um, I pulled the language really from uh, last year and a little bit from the year before just to really emphasize the administration's continued focus on special ed. Um, last year, when we were there in Marin presenting uh, the slides, uh, Brooks and I talked about the administration's continued focus and commitment uh, really is one of their highest priority um, on uh, some reforms around special ed and special ed funding. They talked at the time about a three-phase multi-year plan to reform the funding system, uh, providing increased funding to some, uh, but not all, um, but also um, addressing some areas, uh, uh, some specific areas of interest in administration around equity and accountability and inclusive, inclusivity. Um, the governor really continues that same thought um, uh, in his $300 million investment this year uh, specifically in early intervention programs, which he's addressed in his last two budgets as well. Um, in, in those budgets, part of that was looked was uh, one-time funds that turned into recurring funds. Um, all of this 300 million is intended to be recurring, uh, not one time. Uh, we have not seen the trailer bill language. It's not actually due till February 1st uh, to determine eligibility for the existing uh, to, on how these funds are to be used. Um, I would say, my hope um, would be that they would allow support of existing services and not just be built upon new and expanded services. Um, however, uh, my sense would be this trailer bill will uh, require that um, this 300 million be used for new and expanded, uh, maybe slash improved services for our youngest kids um, in uh, special needs kids. So these are uh, preschool and infant um, types of programs up through um, K. Uh, there's a small amount of money provided for special ed uh, professional learning networks, specifically uh, around um, helping districts um, understand and apply for uh, federal Medi-Cal funds. Um, and uh, uh, this is a long running program where school districts can access uh, uh, federal Medi-Cal funds for a variety of the services that they provide to special needs students and even some other um, students, uh, Section 504 um, students in some cases and so on. So there's some development of some professional development and the distribution of that professional development on that topic. And then also to begin to look at non-public school placements, specifically around the areas of certification and oversight of NPS facilities and those programs. Uh, so most of you know, non-public school placements are uh, an option that you have when you work through the individual education program and plan rather IEP with your, your uh, parents and the student and your IEP team of uh, experts and professionals. Uh, sometimes you're not able to serve uh, a student uh, in the least restrictive environment and the most appropriate environment um, in your own school district. And so you contract with another provider to provide the educational um, and other services for that student. As you know from media headlines, uh, we've had some difficulty in this area the last several years uh, with, with a, a couple non-public school placements. And so this is to study that topic. Uh, apportionment deferral buy-downs, uh, 9.2 billion to buy down roughly 70%, just over 70, 71% of the K-12 apportionment deferrals. So remember in the current year budget, in lieu of making cuts to education, the final budget deal between the administration um, and the legislature was uh, to make relatively minor um, cuts to education, but uh, to really uh, deal with the, the revenue reduction 
um, to school that the state expected in its own revenues and that played out to Proposition 98, uh, that that would be handled through the state's deferral or delay of making payments, uh, monthly payments to school districts of their LCFF or other um, types of um, state aid. Um, specifically, as you all know, because you're dealing with this right now in the current year, um, the governor proposed or, or the state budget enacted a deferral of a part of February next month. February's apportionment to November, uh, March's apportionment to October, um, April's apportionment to September, uh, May's apportionment to August, and June's apportionment to July. Um, in addition to the impacts on 21-22, you'll recall that that um, actually started last year. The apportionment deferrals actually started last year in June, and we uh, deferred all of June's apportionment to July. Uh, a June to July deferral is uh, for most school districts, certainly not all in charter schools, is not a big deal. Uh, it's a delay of a couple weeks usually, um, and it's not at, um, uh, it's usually something that can be um, dealt with locally and that the district or charter doesn't have to go out and borrow to make up for the, the delay in payment by the state. What the governor proposes to do is basically eliminate this February through May deferral in 2022. So I want to be really clear, it does not eliminate the deferrals that are on the books for this year that start next month and go through June. So if you as a school district, your staff has come to you as a board um, and superintendent um, and asked to borrow money from other funds in the school district by resolution or to enter into a tax and revenue anticipation note or to work with your county treasurer for an advanced apportionment of cash during this period of time, um, all, that, all those plans need to stay in place. Uh, the proposal in the budget is to not repeat those plans in 22, in 21, 22 fiscal year. However, they, um, uh, they do leave the June to July apportionment in June of 22 to July of 22 in place. That's the 3.7 billion. Um, it is important to understand that it really doesn't matter what the amount is. I, I'm gonna tell you right now, all of June's apportionment will be deferred to July whether it totals 3.7 billion or it totals 4 billion, uh, it will all be deferred to July, um, irrespective of the dollar amount. However, if the June apportionment uh, total across the state is less than 3.7, then there is a potential impact on May of 22 being deferred to July as well, or a portion of May. So the bottom line is they need to defer at least 3.7 billion um, in 22 in fiscal year 21-22 into fiscal year 22-23. They'll do that all with in June, unless they fall short, and then they'll have to do some pieces of May. Um, let me also address two other issues, one back up under the 9.2 billion bullet there, and then one in a minute under the 3.7 billion. The first is that third bullet under 9.2 that uh, some of you will remember that the enacted budget uh, does call for the current year in this year, starting next month, deferrals to be set aside and the deferrals to be canceled if the feds provided the state um, an additional stimulus funds by mid-October. Um, number one, the feds didn't do that. They didn't pass the most recent stimulus bill until late December. And in that bill, there are uh, relatively small um, unrestricted dollars that the state could have used to um, cancel a deferral. The October timeframe worked. That was plenty of advanced time to uh, cancel the current year deferrals and avoid the need for school districts to come up with alternative uh, cash liquidity through borrowing, uh, transactivity, and so on. However, this is not one of the items that the legislature would take up on an emergency basis here in, in January, and even if they chose to, it likely would be February um, before um, that was enacted. Um, and that means that we would not be able to impact February's deferral and likely not be able to impact March's deferral. They would still happen. Um, and so some of you may say, well, that's okay, cancel April, May, and June. But here's the problem, why we wait for the legislature to enact that and the governor to negotiate that, if in fact that was 
um, going to be done. And that's not the proposal uh, right now from the administration. But if that was going to be done, some of you would have already issued your trans. Most trans pools across the state are funding in February. Once you issue your trans, trans or short-term notes, they don't have call provisions, they don't have prepayment provisions, you will have already expended all of the cost of issuance. And you, even if you did prepay it, you would have to pay the full amount of interest as if you had uh, not prepaid and kept the note, um, didn't pay the note until maturity in November. And so, or whenever your note is due. Um, and so there's the, each day that goes by, there's limited opportunity to have a positive impact here. Uh, because once a district um, issues its trans, they need to stay on that course. Let me also say this, that if you issue a tax exempt trans, and let's just say the state came along and canceled April, May, and June's deferral, um, you would not meet your forecasted deficit amount. And that's a problem for the IRS. They would assess a penalty against you. And so uh, for all those reasons, plus a whole bunch more, um, there's not a current proposal to eliminate the current year deferrals. Let me also speak to the bullet that says trade-offs available to eliminate the remaining deferrals. As Brooks can um, allude to, this, this issue of leaving some deferrals out there um, and not paying off the full amount um, is certainly something that will be debated in the legislature. The leadership of the legislature has said on more than one occasion that they want to see all the deferrals bought off. Um, so it will be a topic that uh, will be present starting um, in next week's uh, budget hearings uh, in the assembly and following the week after in the Senate, and they will continue. Um, uh, and so uh, the state has reasons for not doing that. There are gonna be some trade-offs. If they choose to pay off 100% of the deferrals next year, then that's less money to do some other things that we're gonna talk about. So that's what I mean by the trade-offs. So in the governor's budget proposal, there are two, uh, what we call early action. I alluded to one of these is immediate action and the other is early action. Uh, these are two dollar-wise significant Proposition 98 investments. They're both one-time in nature um, grant programs uh, uh, in, that would start in the current year that we're in right now. They would be funded in part by this acknowledgement that our revenues as a state are up over what were estimated last spring. Um, funding for both programs, as I indicated, would start in 2021. We'll go into that more detail in just a second. The first is a $2 billion one-time safe in-person instructional incentive grant. Um, and this is really to incentivize districts uh, to reopen instructional programs in person uh, in a safe uh, manner and when it is safe to do so. Um, and we'll go into that in some detail in a moment. There's an additional program, uh, 4.6 billion, called the Expand Learning Time and Academic Intervention. Uh, this is a grant program. Uh, the first $2 billion program you would apply for and you have to meet certain conditions. Uh, the second program would be uh, just a formula driven grant. You would not apply and, the, and its funds would begin to be apportioned out in March. So a little deeper dive in, in Brooks, uh, obviously is uh, one of the experts on, on this particular program, um, but a $2 billion um, investment. Uh, I think it's important, this is how I explain it. There are two tracks to this um, idea. The first track um, is really related to safety um, and its components are required. Um, these deal with um, the development of a COVID-19 um, safety plan or what we now have a new acronym called CSP. Uh, that includes two components that I'll talk about in just a second. One is really the Cal OSHA requirements that uh, were, took effect at the end of November. And the second is a school specific, what we call um, checklist. The second, which is optional, is actually applying for the incentive grant. Uh, you don't have to apply for the incentive grant. Uh, you don't have to jump through the hurdles to do that. Uh, but if you are off offering in-person instruction, you do have to have the safety components that the California Department of Public Health um, just last week issued a new set of consolidated guidelines. Um, as Brooks would uh, um, can, can speak to with probably more clarity than I, the program is built really on four pillars. One is around funding, one's around safety and mitigation, one's around oversight and assistance, and 
The fourth is around transparency and accountability. So again, the safety plan has two components, the Cal OSHA requirements that are already imposed upon you. Uh, these are very similar to your pre-existing um, IIPP plan, which um, you probably all have board policy around um, and all have a plan. Uh, it's re been required for decades, actually. Um, it's a, a injury and illness protection, injury and illness prevention plan. It's what IIPP stands for. Uh, there are some additional Cal OSHA requirements that you need to incorporate into that given the pandemic. It adds to it because the Cal OSHA requirements are uh, generic for all industries, if you will. Um, they're not specific and they, well, not only are they generic for all industries, but they're specific to employees, right? Cal OSHA is about employee safety, workplace safety. Um, and so there's another layer added to it called the school guidance checklist um, to make it specific to our school districts. The incentive grant, uh, which is the optional piece does have, um, I like to think of it in terms of kind of three component pieces. One is you have to have the safety component in place. So the CSP, um, as part of the CSP, uh, you have to make an offer of asymptomatic testing at a specific cadence that's tied to the adjusted case uh, rates, your COVID um, positivity rates. Um, again, I emphasize the word offer. Can't force anybody to go take a test, either employees or students. Uh, but you have to make a reasonable offer and accommodate that. Um, its second component is you have to have buy-in by your labor partners, uh, both certificated and classified. And the third component uh, is the timeline component. Uh, it's fairly aggressive uh, with the first deadline being February 1st, a subsequent deadline being uh, March 1st. Um, those equate in part to the amount of the incentive grant you would receive because obviously we did the earlier one, you've got more school days in the school year yet to go. So there's a little higher funding for the March, I mean, for the February one application versus the March one. There is flexibility uh, for our districts with high case rates above 25 per 100,000 adjusted case rates where they can still apply for the grant. And if you will kind of be on the approved grant list and then uh, make their transition to in-person uh, when it's safe to do so. Brooks, you want to offer any thoughts on this or save it to the end, whatever your pleasure is? Yeah, I'd maybe just hop in to elaborate a little bit. Mike, appreciate the, the overview, captured all the key components. You know, I think the uh, the questions that come up most frequently, and I, I spent the better part of my day um, in a Senate hearing on this topic, is questions come up, you know, it, it, how much of this is new? And the COVID-19 safety plan, hopefully uh, most of you who are on have had a chance to take a look at it. Uh, the Cal OSHA component, obviously that's been in place as a requirement from Cal OSHA since uh, November 30th of last year. And the school guidance checklist, uh, for those of you, and I know uh, likely many of the folks here, I have schools that are open. Uh, you've set up your safety plans, you know, use the guidance that I know Mary Jane and the team at, at Marin have, have provided. Uh, you will have covered these components, uh, and it really is just a summary. Uh, the checklist that is is a summary of previous CDPH uh, uh, guidance and what's there, uh, and the checklist it puts there. And so, really, the the only new piece is you go through that and then you post those, um, and that's that's all there really is to it in terms of that new plan. Um, you know, I'll, I'll leave it there, and, and Mike, do a turn to the extended learning time. Okay. All right. Sorry, I didn't mean to move the, I was attempting to get my, while you were talking, I was attempting yeah. to get the camera back on and I hit the, I hit yeah. my, uh, no, my no. I wasn't trying to speed you up, sorry. No, that works, we can, uh, I, I can take a prompt. No, I think um, <laughs> you know, the other piece is I would just underline for, uh, we received lots of questions where folks are asking about uh, getting this grant. And to emphasize this, of course, is uh, the governor's proposal that was rolled out with our Safe Schools for All plan. Um, but at this moment, it is a proposal. Uh, the legislature, uh, starting with the hearing that the Senate had today, uh, we understand the Assembly will have a hearing uh, early next week, we'll be taking that up. So some of these pieces may shift. And so this is the outline of what the proposal as it is, just like uh, the budget overall, uh, but just want to clarify that uh, when it comes up. Uh, 
Um, the second program that the governor proposes to have early action on and to implement in part this year um, is uh, a new grant program called Expand Learning Time and Academic Intervention. A uh, trailer bill for this program is already out, which is why I've given you a couple extra slides of details, uh, really just pulling directly from that trailer bill. Uh, it's a $4.6 billion uh, one-time Proposition 98 program. It's about the idea, it really follows um, some of the thinking that we had last spring and over the summer in the development of the learning loss mitigation um, program and strategies that was uh, heavily funded by federal dollars, uh, but for which the rules were, um, the state could set the rules. Um, so it really continues to build upon that, but with the idea that there's a, um, uh, that we, we potentially, we see the light at the end of the tunnel over the pandemic and as we, transition back to in-person and transition to a new school year, we've got a lot of work to do uh, to deal with the mitigation of, of learning loss. So uh, there is a priority for um, uh, several subgroups of students, uh, both in the trailer bill language and also in the funding component. Um, it is uh, really met this, this next bullet, extending instructional learning time um, and the bullets that follow um, really give you an idea of what you can, uh, what the, uh, the policy um, interests are and, and what you would be spending your money uh, and resources of this grant on. The nitty gritty around the grant um, as proposed in the trailer bill from the administration is $1,000 per homeless student enrolled in 2021. Uh, so we would, we would uh, um, have those counts and fund all LEAs uh, with that criteria. $725 per ADA for our state special schools. And for those not familiar with state special schools, we have three of them, California School for the Deaf Fremont, California School for the Deaf uh, Riverside, uh, which is where I live, um, and uh, California School for um, the Blind. Um, and so uh, you don't often see them called out uh, in uh, funding priorities and in trailer bill. Uh, so uh, uh, kind of a, a nuance with respect to this grant to very specifically acknowledge those three um, campuses with um, uh, students with disabilities um, that are served there. Um, the remaining funds after you subtract these two components would be allocated proportionally based on your 2021, so current year LCFF entitlement. So that takes into consideration your base grant your, your, your supplemental grant and your concentration grant, and actually also in your grade span adjustment um, grant as well. Apportionment would be in two equal um, portions, uh, both one in March and one in July. So you can see this is spread out over two fiscal years, uh, but to get going right away. Um, the word apportionment is just a fancy word for when you're gonna get paid. Uh, for those of you that um, don't follow that, appropriation is budget, apportionments, kind of a cash event as opposed to a budget event. Um, it does support eligible expenditures through June of 22, so all of next fiscal year. Um, it does require an addendum to your 21-22 LCAP that you would be adopting in the May-June time period, and the trailer bill language spe uh, spells out some dates uh, in which um, the uh, state superintendent and actually Mr. Allen uh, need to um, provide uh, the addendum and the template for the addendum and, and so on for, for you to follow. Uh, I suspect as has been the case in the past, it'll be uh, fairly straightforward uh, with respect to this particular item. Um, go ahead, Brooks. Yeah, Mike, I just want to briefly jump in here and, um, and just highlight that part of the reason that we see uh, that we rolled out the trailer bill on this piece uh, around expand learning time and academic interventions at the same time that we're talking about the in-person instruction grant is because uh, the governor feels a great deal of urgency uh, to both provide support for schools that are open already, as well as uh, to provide supports for schools that uh, want to reopen and, and need those additional uh, pieces. And it, as Mike alluded to earlier, uh, those really coming in, in four separate pillars um, and this one really being around the funding uh, set of supports, but also health and safety, testing supports and so on. Uh, and at the same time, really trying to encourage everyone uh, to do what I, I know um, many of you who I see names on the call, I know are part of already thinking about already uh, and others that I'm sure are as well, which is to start thinking about how we 
uh, both potentially extend uh, this school year, uh, depending on when we're able to get uh, all students back um, more thoroughly for in-person instruction, look for where you extend school days, look for other uh, forms of intervention, uh, really going through the bullets that were on Mike's slides. Um, but the, the urgency there is to get the money to folks now, because we know that when there's discussion of how you extend the year, or you look to the summer, or you look to an early fall start, uh, those are things that require a lot of planning. And the idea of getting the money out and in folks' hands as early as possible with known amounts. Uh, the goal there is to enable that plan to take place with some really concrete uh, numbers at your disposal, if you think about that. Uh, and then there are uh, folks, including uh, county offices, uh, state system of support, Department of Education, California Public Educational Excellence, others who are seeking at the same timeline uh, to be providing a lot of resources and supports for those who are looking uh, for ideas, best practices, and models uh, for both how to uh, address either extended time, specific kinds of reading interventions, others. Uh, but as our state board president and, and advisor to the governor, uh, Dr. Linda Darling Hammond often emphasizes, the real hope is here uh, that folks don't uh, treat this as um, a, a drive to or an encouragement to look at a remedial uh, type of approach, but to really look at it in terms of how we try to accelerate learning, um, trying to avoid uh, even terminology around learning loss and really talking about taking students where they are uh, and looking at new ways to drive uh, that instruction. Uh, in intensive ways, um, but not to kind of fall back, as I'm sure most of you uh, could lecture me well on about kind of drill and kill uh, that we look at. And so the idea here is to incentivize uh, and provide the resources to plan uh, to do this. And then as Mike highlighted and, and seeing that you can use this for funds through June of 2022. Uh, so it's both near-term and longer-term planning. So that, that's really at the heart of this effort and why you see both rolling out at you know, a similar time frame. So Brooks, I'm going to let you cover all the rest of the slides because when you talk, my my video comes back on. <laughs> so um, not that anybody wants not anybody wants to see my face. Let me also add one more piece to to Brooks's comment um, that I think is important. It may not have been uh, one of the thoughts, uh, but but I think it, it it's really is, uh, as Brooks talked about the early action and get so that you know in early March is the intent about what you're going to receive around this so that you can do planning. But it also in part acknowledges the apportionment starts in March, not just here's your grant award, but the actual payment starts in March. That's very important for those of you with cash deferral impacts um, because you didn't know about this when you sized your trans. Um, and if you intend to spend some of this money uh, during the deferral period, having the ca extra cash on hand as a result of this grant program actually is a very positive thing. Um, you won't, uh, uh, and so I, I just wanna say that um, to, to acknowledge that, that positive aspect of the, not only the early grant award, but the early apportionment, um, I think is an important piece. So I'm going to, uh, uh, those are the areas that I felt like there was gonna be the most questions about, so I've kind of, took some extra time to go through those. Uh, the slides that are left are, I'm gonna deal on kind of a high level um, that we don't have trailer bill language around most of these. However, not all these programs are new to us. The concept of these programs, even the titles of the programs are not necessarily new to us. Uh, when we talk about educator effectiveness block grant, we can look back several years and see that same block grant and have a good sense of probably where uh, the trailer bill will go. But this, this continues um, one of Brooks' boss, the president of the State Board of Ed, Linda Darling Hammond. Um, uh, she, um, in her role, um, obviously influences the governor's thinking and priorities around um, how Proposition 98 funds are spent. Uh, Linda has spent a lifetime uh, as an educator and as a researcher, um, and her work is, is acknowledged truly around the world. And in fact, for those of you not aware, uh, Linda has been President Biden's uh, trans chair of his transition team for education. Um, and uh, uh, we see Linda's um, fingerprints on some of the early Biden proposals. We see Linda's fingerprints on some of the um, names. Certainly we see her fingerprints on names uh, that, that President Biden has nominated for both uh, 
Secretary of Education and Deputy Secretary of Education. And so we're grateful for her, her work and her counsel to the governor. But she, as I think most of you, this is hard to debate. Um, uh, I think most of us share this conviction that a well-prepared teacher workforce is, is truly a significant factor in uh, high achievement for all and in closing the achievement gap. So with that in mind, the governor proposes, yes, sir. Oh, sorry, Mike, no, go ahead. Uh, 315 million in one time, and that's important. And I think we would all acknowledge most of these things need to be recurring, not one time. One time investments every few years doesn't do the trick. But once we get it out there and if the economy continues to grow and stabilize, there'll be an opportunity to turn one time into recurring um, is some of the thinking. But at this point, the governor hedges the out year forecasts a little bit by putting a lot, labeling a lot of funds as one time because those are the first things then that it will pull back on uh, if the economy uh, uh, slows or begins to contract in any form. So of that 315 million, 250 million on what I just alluded to, educator effectiveness block grant, um, 50 million on uh, creating resources and providing training on social emotional learning and trauma informed practice is something that we truly learn more and more about um, and its impact on kids and their learning um, every day. Um, early math initiatives specifically targeted at teachers in pre-k through third grade um, and then uh, kind of picking up where we left the legislative session off last year um, over bills around ethnic studies and requirements for graduation requirements um, in our high schools uh, and investment to provide training and materials on that subject matter. Uh, additional 225 million one time uh, regarding uh, teacher recruitment and the preparation specifically uh, of teachers in our, in our preparation pipelines. 100 million of that is non-98 uh, for the Golden State Teacher Grant Award, um, the teacher residency program and then um, a continued funding um, and increased funding actually to expand a, an existing program uh, where we invest uh, our classified school employees, specifically those that are um, already in the classroom as paraprofessionals in opportunities, help them get back to school or, um, or to get to school and, and work on their teaching credential. Um, Another theme in the governor's budget, uh, 700 million to support investments in student health and well-being. Again, a lot of one time and not all Prop 98. The 400 million piece here is both federal and non-Prop 98 money uh, related to early intervention, behavioral health services, um, and, and so on. 264 million to expand uh, existing networks and establish new networks around community schools. Um, 25 million on uh, building a stronger partnerships with our county mental health facility uh, services, uh, county behavioral health to support student mental health. Um, and then um, uh, 10 million to, for a specific county office to, uh, to identify, develop, and, and circulate um, school climate related surveys around the pandemic. Um, continued interest by this governor, obviously, in early education and child care access. All, um, early education uh, it, it always has been, will always be one of his priorities. Um, we, we see that in the $300 million ongoing Prop 98 investment in, uh, for our special needs. We see that in uh, continuing uh, to invest and plan, um, including uh, putting some dollars behind uh, the master plan for early learning and, and care, which just came out in December, uh, available for your perusal and to read, um, and would encourage you to do that. Um, 250 million uh, over several years uh, for what many of us call um, uh, extended or expanded uh, transitional kindergarten. This is the idea of those four-year-olds uh, to start them right out the beginning of the school year. Remember that you do get funding on an ADA basis for TK, but that funding doesn't kick in until the student turns five. Um, and that's not always September or August when you start school. So the idea here is uh, an incentive grant really to incentivize school districts to enroll those students at the beginning of the TK program, beginning of the year, uh, whether you're getting funding or not. This would provide some funding. It is intended to be a grant program, not an ADA. Uh, funded program. Um, we haven't seen the trailer bill language yet, 
uh, but um, uh, expect it to be a grant program that you would apply for. 50 million to support preparation of TK teachers and provide TK and K teachers with training. Um, I will say this again, um, Mr. Allen, you um, listen carefully, please. Um, just giving him a hard time. Um, TK and K are different, take different skill sets. And a generic elementary, uh, generic general credential that elementary teachers have that authorize them to teach K through six, even TK through six, uh, it, is, it doesn't work. And so if we're going to acknowledge TK and K in these special ways, uh, at some point, CTC needs to acknowledge the credentialing issues. And I know they they talk about it and they've tackled some of them, uh, but moving a fifth grade teacher to TK that's not prepared to teach TK just because you don't need them as a fifth grade teacher anymore, uh, just is not ideal. Um, so, and then a continued uh, investment, uh, one-time investment to construct and retrofit uh, facilities for full day TK and K. This is not new. Uh, we've seen this now, I think the last four years, I think we actually began to see this in Jerry Brown's last budget, if I remember right. Um, uh, and it's not been well subscribed to, but the idea is if facilities are keeping you from offering full day K, where you need to have a AM PM sharing a room, uh, as opposed to a full K, uh, then there's money available for you to apply to um, uh, add or retrofit facilities. And the retrofit ideas take a third grade classroom and add restrooms to it because restrooms are a component piece of a typical K room. And on this topic, why uh, Mary Jane is back, uh, um, we did a lot of work for the SBI in the governor's office last spring on surveying around childcare. And I just continue to hold Marin up as an example that um, even in the midst of the early days of the pandemic, you, you made, a, made a commitment to the area of childcare um, for your first responders and your healthcare workers and others. And I, I think all of us across the state uh, use that as an example to continue that conversation with others. So as we look ahead, um, this is a great budget. Uh, this is absolutely a great budget. Even in normal times, this would be a great budget, um, but it's especially great given where we thought it would be three and a half months ago. Um, but there are some stormy roads ahead. Uh, number one, the state, if you look at their revenue forecasts for the out years, while they're forecasting a, a decent year over year growth, uh, they are they're showing that narrowing down and some difficult times ahead for the state on revenues. Uh, but for school districts, I wanna highlight two things uh, for 22-23, right? except for our charter schools, and I'll get to them in a second. In 22-23, we'll be presented with two significant fiscal challenges. Uh, cliffs, I think, is a, probably a better word even than challenges. Uh, the first is that the two-year employer contribution rate rollback for um, public pensions for CalSTRS and CalPERS expires at the end of 21-22. So you don't hear the governor's, but you don't see in the governor's budget proposal uh, um, additional dollars going into buying down the employer's contribution rate. Remember, he did that last year as part of the Budget Act. He bought it down for two years, this year being the first, next year, 21-22 being the second year. Um, it just didn't eliminate the scheduled increase, but he actually rolled it back to rates from several years back. Um, and so that provision, that temporary provision, expires in June of 22. So on July 1 of 22, in your first day of your 22-23 school year, you're going to be exposed to uh, what would have been um, the STRS and PERS employer contribution rates had we not had a pandemic and had this uh, temporary rollback. And so that's not just rolling back to where it was in 1920. It is rolling it back. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's not just rolling it forward, not back, sorry rolling it forward to, to where it was in 1920, but it's actually looking ahead to what, what, what would have been the rates in 22-23, okay, which, would, which were higher than 1920. So keep that in mind. The second thing for those of you that are declining enrollment, I realize 
a number of you are, but not all of you. Um, but uh, this year we're not collecting ADA for uh, apportionment purposes. So we're using 1920. So if you were declined between uh, 1920 and 2021, you're not feeling the pinch for that because we're actually using 1920. This is part of our special hold harmless that uh, was put in place as part of this year's budget act. That expires in June. And so starting July 1 of 22, uh, I'm sorry, July 1 of 21, uh, we'll be back to our normal ADA hold harmless provisions, which are the higher of current year or prior year. If you're declining, the higher number will be the prior year. And while the prior year would normally be 2021, this year, right, we're not collecting the data. So you're going to jump back all the way to 1920. So you will have a hold harmless in place in the current year if you're declining and in next year if you're declining. But all that's going to catch up to you in on July 1 of uh, 2022. When you your prior year at that point will be 2122, uh, which will reflect the decline uh, multiple years of decline. Um, so I remind you of that. The exception are charter schools who are do not have that hold harmless provision on a traditional basis. They're always funded on current year basis. That will go into effect this July 1 of 21. So for 21-22, charter schools will lose the special um, hold harmless provision we put in place because of the pandemic. Everybody actually loses it, not just charter schools, but the impact will be immediate on charter schools because they'll go to current year 21-22 funding. With that, Ms. Mars. Okay. Um, any final comments, Mr. Allen? No, I, I, would, I would say we're time for questions. So I guess I'll just I just add one point of emphasis. Um, so Mr. Fine ran through the, the teacher training and recruitment pieces and he uh, really appreciated his acknowledgement of what Dr. Uh, Dellen Hammond has focused on her entire career and really and, and you do see her fingerprints here because it's, it's quite intentional. Um, just want to call out, it's hard, you can't see it in the bullets, but in, uh, and when trail bill isn't out yet, uh, but even in our initial presentation, really emphasize that that 250 million in educator effectiveness block grant is designed uh, to provide districts, county offices with uh, the ability to ensure uh, that teachers have the ability to go receive training in specific areas that are really responsive to um, the current situation we find ourselves in. So looking at issues around restorative practices, trauma-informed practices, uh, re-engaging students, uh, and so forth. And so uh, really in recognition of the fact that, well, it's been obviously incredibly important to be strengthening our teacher pipeline and then supporting all of our teachers in, in any given year, uh, particularly a year like this one where we know, um, you know burnout and stress and pressures involved are extreme, uh, looking to find ways to help provide professional development in those areas, as well as then building out uh, both through uh, the Gold State program and the teacher residency program, just turning other things on the next slide, um, really emphasizing there to build uh, those pipeline elements uh, and of course in, in provide investments in those who are willing to go teach uh, in fields of high need as well as in areas of high need. And so just to emphasize those and, and particularly think about how we uh, help a very successful program of uh, those uh, classified employees who are interested uh, in, in traveling that pipeline path that's proven effective, so additional investments there. Uh, so it, it, these would be incredibly important in any year, uh, but now in the current situation, we find ourselves uh, even more so. And so you know, I think you'll hear continuing emphasis there, uh, both from the governor and from, and from Linda. Okay, we have about 15 questions that have come in. And I'm going to start with the questions that were submitted. Mary Jane, did you have something you yeah, wanted to add? I'd love to, um, uh, Brooks, while, while we have you um, here, I'd love to jump just for a second to the um, um, possibility to uh, get additional resources uh, from that $2 billion that's going to be available. I understand it has to go from the legislature. Uh, through the legislature, I think you're aware that in Marin County, about 86% of our schools are open for in-person instruction, you know, at this point and have been for, for some for many, many months. 
Um, and for our districts, definitely the resources are going to be um, welcome in that there has been a lot that that has gone into making sure um, that uh, teachers feel safe, kids are safe, and we have, you know, great data to show sort of what our outcomes are. Um, here's a couple of areas if you could just address. One, um, is there going to be any change on the uh, testing cadence? I know that there's been a request to consider something uh, more localized related to the, the testing. And just for those of you on the call here, currently, if you're in deep purple, which happens to be the status that Marin is, you would need to test every student and every child, every student and every staff person every week um, if you're using a PCR test. And I think you're aware that that can be quite uh, cost prohibitive. We figured out if the test was hundred dollars, we would make it, you know, whatever. So, so that's one thing um, that we're looking at to try to see, see about, you know, getting the resources. And then the second thing is that we feel ready to go with some support for our districts so that they'll be ready to post, you know, by next week. But is that timeline actually realistic now? Um, the February 1st, the, you know, posting by January 25th, I think on the website, and then the February 1st, or do you see that there's going to be some some flexibility there. So working backwards, I'd say with respect to the posting deadline, I would just emphasize that uh, there's a requirement to post your plan by February 1st that applies regardless of whether you're going to apply for the grant program. So just okay. to know for the COVID-19 safety plan, uh, that's, that's the case. Um, with respect to the timeline for applying for the program, given that it is not enacted at this point, and I'd just remind folks, the governor uh, announced this back in December uh, so if the timeline of thinking when the legislature will be back and be enacted, um, th those are the timelines at that point. Um, that is something that conceivably could shift. I, I, um, fortunately, I can't predict where the legislature will land uh, and, and where the negotiation will land, but I think certainly acknowledging the fact that we are um, only one week away essentially from that deadline and uh, the legislature has not acted yet, um, I think it's safe to say that we could see that that move uh, in terms of the timeline there. And that's certainly something that's under consideration. Uh, with respect to testing, uh, like quickly just address the question of cost uh, real quickly. I know that um, obviously folks have set up uh, their own arrangements. I know Curative, for instance, uh, and Marin has been oftentimes used for folks. Uh, the Valencia Branch Lab, which is state supported lab, uh, is really ramped up capacity, has excess capacity right now, uh, and is looking to partner with folks. We can get uh, that costs down uh, significantly. And for all staff, um, that can all be built through health plans uh, with nothing out of pocket. Uh, so really, and then we have an application that the state does with Medi-Cal to cover all students who'd be eligible uh, to cover student testing. Uh, that still would leave you with uh, potentially some student, the uh, cost of student testing uh, for those who wouldn't qualify. Uh, but that would really be the, the one cost. Uh, and Valencia Branch Lab is doing pretty innovative things right now to also drive other costs down, looking at uh, issues of cooling, uh, that's a pool testing to drive costs down, uh, as well as issues of convenience to take down costs around time and logistics. Uh, the testing hopefully running, rolling out maybe as early as next week, uh, take home uh, test kits where uh, staff could take home multiple kits, uh, bring them in and drop them off. Um, and also dealing with student testing, uh, providing a lot of resources and technical support uh, for how to do that, where it's essentially, um, you know, it's, it's still a self-administered swab for students, uh, staff supervised, uh, you can do bundled collection. Uh, so there's some real efficiencies there that can be built in. Uh, with respect to whether uh, the testing, it's the cadences that are supported by the state uh, would remain a condition of funding um, you know, that is something that the Senate uh, debated at great length today. Um, as, as you reflected, there have been uh, questions about whether that would be something that would be adjusted. Uh, as of now, the proposal still includes that as a condition. Um, but as, as something moves through the legislative process, uh, that could be an area of change. It's hard to, hard to know what may or may not change. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, here's the good news. We signed our MOU with Valencia for our county today. So, so we are moving forward with that as well. Yes. Sorry, Tarina, back to you. Okay, so I'm going to start with the questions that came in in advance of tonight's presentation. And the first question was, can we have clarification on the Cal-OSHA requirement 
for the in-person grant application? So as I understand that question, um, it's asking if there is a tie between the Calosha uh, safety plan and the grant. And, and there, there is in so much that it is, you have to have your COVID-19 safety plan uh, put together and posted um, as part of the eligibility requirements for the grant. But I, I just wanna be really clear, that's something that um, the Cal OSHA uh, emergency temporary standards came online in November uh, 30th of last year. Uh, and that plan is required uh, as part of that piece, as well as required as part of the COVID-19 safety plan that you need to do uh, regardless of whether you apply uh, for the grant or not. And as I, as I noted earlier, it is one of the two pieces of the COVID-19 safety plan. It's the Cal OSHA uh, piece, and then you have the CDPH checklist. And those two are the two component parts of your safety plan. Can we have clarification on the certification of devices or broadband access requirements for the in-person grant application? Yeah, so I think there's a, there's a, yeah. Yeah, there, there's a requirement in the current uh, draft language for the proposal that in order to qualify, you'd need to certify uh, that all students who are engaged in online learning have connectivity and devices. Um, it, that is not new. Uh, there are pieces, uh, learn, if you go back to the learning continuity plan uh, that requires that you have devices and connectivity for those students engaged in distance learning. Um, so that, that is essentially an assurance that you are complying with those provisions that are there. Mike, this may be a question for you. Are there exclusions to programs proposed in the governor's budget for basic aid districts? None that I'm aware of in the in the added programs. Obviously, the COLA on LCFF may or um, would not apply. It'll factor in to their basic aid status, but it, it it wouldn't necessarily provide them additional funds. But as far as the list of new or expanded programs, no, um, there should be. There's no exclusions I'm aware of. We haven't seen trailer bill yet, Trina, but there's nothing in the nature of those programs historically that would make a distinction. Yeah, to, to the best of my knowledge, and particularly as Mike says, for the two that we've uh, rolled out the trailer bill language about the in-person instruction grant and then the extended time, uh, basically a district and uh, community funded district would remain uh, eligible. And, and just real quickly, by my read of it, um, one is an entitlement, one is a grant application. The in-person is a grant application, the extended learning is an, is an entitlement, meaning districts will not have to apply. That's correct. correct. It's formula driven and it'll be automatic. Yep. Right. Um, so this is, this, is the, this is a question that has you, uh, requires that you pull out your crystal ball. Yeah. <laughs> How soon do you expect the legislature to act on the governor's proposals, the, the, the emergency proposals? Uh, that, that does require a crystal ball. I, I, you know, <laughs> as I just uh, mentioned earlier, uh, the Senate had a hearing today on the in-person instruction grant. Uh, we understand, I believe the assembly's hearing is going to be on Monday. Um, you know, the hope is, I'll say from the administration, is that uh, we view both of these as very urgent matters. Uh, so we would hope it, it moves quickly, um, but we, we will see. And, and I think it's important to acknowledge that uh, in response to the governor's request, the legislature has accelerated its hearing schedule. Uh, yeah. Hearings that would normally take place in late February and even March are being accelerated to the next couple of weeks. That doesn't mean they're going to act. I'm just saying they, they've acknowledged the request and they're at least going through the steps on a as accelerated, frankly, as they can pull it off. Yeah, absolutely. And do you have any information about how schools will report the public health mandate for in-person data? Yes, in fact, I um, believe my colleagues were kind of said that the notice should have gone out to County Office of Education today uh, with uh, information that will then be disseminated out to all, all schools because this applies uh, not only to public schools but also to private schools. Um, basically, there will be a web form um, that you will go to and indicate uh, whether you are uh, fully reopened 
uh, whether you're in hybrid, uh, whether you are um, operating only under the cohorting guidance or you're in full uh, distance learning. And we would be reporting that at an LEA level uh, by grade span, essentially. And so that will be uh, go online and the first reporting deadline will be this upcoming Monday, January 20th. So Brooks, just to add to that, um, I did receive the backup for that today at about noon. I'm about to press go uh, to our districts. It applies to all of our private independent parochial schools as well. And please, if everybody can look for this email, there's a webinar training tomorrow from, I think it's 12 to one, uh, that will be available for everyone to join to hear more about this, but obviously a pretty tight turnaround for people since they need to start posting on Monday. So I'll press go in, in, in just a second on that. Thank you. Great, thank you. Okay, this question is gonna be for Mike and it's under the advice column. What is the current thinking about keeping ADA revenue flat going forward as schools rebuild COVID impacted enrollment? So I think as a general rule of thumb, there's no rule, you shouldn't do that. You should do spend the time and the effort on analysis of your enrollment and your attendance patterns, um, especially this year. Uh, we know from uh, early looks at uh, the state data by enrollment or uh, state enrollment data from CalPADS uh, that we see significant drops at TK and K. You need to get a handle on that in your communities and understand what's going on. You've got to start that outreach if you haven't already. We, we need to know whether those kids were just held back at home because they were too young and the parent didn't want them in virtual ed. What's the parents thinking? Are they going to enroll them now late in K? Um, or are they going to advance them to first grade based on age? Um, that's why the early action is so important as you develop your program for an extended uh, instructional time, even over the summer, you probably, um, you're going to have to do that homework locally to know what kind of program you should develop, say, for incoming TK or K um, that we missed this year. Um, and so um, I wouldn't just automatically keep it flat. Uh, I would do the detail work that needs to be done and the outreach and then, um, and then move forward. Let me say this, I, I would also, whatever your outcome of that is, I would include on your projections the appropriate enrollment change, up, down, whatever, by whatever number. Don't, don't artificially hold that. If you're going to artificially flatten something out, don't do that in enrollment, do it to the ADA. Uh, we saw this play out this year in, um, in the ability for districts to get credit for increased enrollment. Uh, they flattened their enrollment out because of the pandemic when what they should have done is used accurate data for enrollment and flatten their ADA out that drives revenue. And they didn't do that. And so the data is not readily available to help them. Um, and we've all jumped through hoops to work, work around that and, 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 and to help them, but um, do the work, do, do the work. And it's not gonna be easy. Uh, this is a unique set of circumstances, uh, but, but you've got to reach out and you've got to start talking to your community as a whole, not just your school families, but as a whole and figure out where your kids are that, are, that you expected and aren't there this year. Uh, this is a question about the uh, school services. I'm not sure if you're going to be able to answer it. It says, do I'm we use the lower COLA from school services in the outer two years? Yeah. So I'm very familiar with it. We, we School services and FICMAT talk uh, multiple times a day, especially this time of the year on topics like this, because we, we want to, we, we both reach the same folks um, and we don't want to have a different message. And so we try to coordinate. FICMAT, though, um, is committed to the Department of Finance, and so all of our software um, data comes preloaded, whether that's Projection Pro or the LCFF calculator will always come preloaded when you download it uh, to use it with the Department of Finance numbers. You can change those numbers. Um, I think, uh, number one, it's not some staff member at School Services that's an economist that goes out and recomputes COLA. They actually hire a well-respected Sacramento economist that most of us know, and that's Brad Williams, uh, used to be at the LAO, um, I think even finance at one point, if I remember right. Um, and we all have tremendous respect for Brad. Those are Brad's calculations. Um, probably shouldn't be 
disclosing school services secrets here. I think John Gray actually computes these now. I'm just being silly. But um, I think they're reasonable, the school services approach. There are some there, there are some changes in the Department of Finance data that doesn't, on the surface, doesn't make a lot of sense. The school services data is, is, is uh, moves in a little bit more traditional, um, little softer approach, but that's a local decision. Uh, you know, is your community and is your normal budgeting approach more conservative, more liberal? If it's more conservative, use the school services numbers. If you normally push the envelope, then use the Department of Finance numbers, but understand your risk. What's uh, the first thing I would do is compute the difference between those two and what it means to you. And if you've got plenty of reserves to cover that difference, then then you can use the Department of Finance numbers uh, without a whole lot of problem, right? So understand which data point you use and what that means risk-wise to your district. So Brooks, I, I do know that you have to um, go on to another meeting. Uh, any last minute uh, comments that that you would like to make? Only just a deep appreciation, uh, Mary Jane, for having us, and um, you know, Mike, Mike, for letting me sit shotgun uh, for another year in a different role, um, and really to everyone who's who's listening. Just to the extent, particularly with respect to, I know uh, the host of questions that came my way having to do with the in-person instruction grant, or even the extended timeline. Uh, that, time proposal and, uh, and academic interventions. If, if there's questions around uh, the in-person instruction grant, the school safety plans, others, I would just really commend folks this uh, schools hub that was rolled out on the COVID-19 California uh, website uh, last week has a host of really helpful materials, including uh, offers uh, for technical assistance, uh, videos to watch. If you have concerns, there's ways to, to weigh in there. So just really commend that website and set of resources that was rolled out uh, last week to folks and um you know i just i know there's a lot of leaders on the on the call and express our deep appreciation uh for everything that everyone's doing during this incredibly difficult time um just you know mary jane you've led you've led the charge in so many ways and just uh, deeply appreciative for that well thank you very much and mike we know you're under a tight timeline too so um can we just any how about any closing comments we can look at these questions, Trina, if there's anything here that we might be able to uh, answer and get it back to everybody or anything you see that we need to address. I can, I can answer one real quickly. And that, a question that's come in is basically, if we've already opened, are we still eligible for the in-person grants? And the answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, what is the likelihood that February 1 deadline will happen as proposed? I think we've already answered that a little bit. Are, and for middle and high schools, do they get funded on total enrollment, even though only serving special ed homeless and foster? So I think the question is, what, the, what is the funding for the in-person grant based upon? Is it based upon the number of students you have in person? Total ADA less, less independent study. Because independent so, study doesn't really exist this year as we know it traditionally. Um, uh, summer school on uh, the extended learning can they be learned for used for non certificated staff um, and I think the answer is yet to be determined, maybe. Um, the, the intent is yes, um, and in fact, in fact we, it's in language to even talk about that uh, specifically it's one of the authorized purposes is uh, paraprofessionals providing tutoring which we know can be a, a, a very effective intervention. Yeah, you just have to make sure it's not direct instruction. It's, it's like a tutoring because you do have credentialing and um, assignment misassignment issues. Yep. Is there anything in the proposal about adult education? It gets the one point. Oh. I'm almost certain uh, the only thing that would be in there, it's silent, but I think it, it certainly gets the 1.5% estimated statutory call would not get the compounded COLA, I think, by definition, but I, um, I'd have to, I'd have to look at the detail lines in the budget and see. There was, there was nothing actually talked about or disclosed about it, uh, but it would be buried in the details. So I want to call everyone's attention that Brooks has posted the link that he just referenced to, to the website in the chat. Um, actually, I think it's only showing for us. I'm going to repost it. There we go. 
Um, and yes, this has been recorded and it will be posted to our website um, where this presentation is currently found under um, forums. I've posted that um, also in the chat. So it's at the very beginning of the chat. Um, I will repost it, but I think we have scrolled through as many, there's a lot of comments I will tell, I will say about the testing. Um, and so um, I'm, I'm just, the, because they, they tend to be more commentary in nature, I'm, there's nothing really to, um, to answer, but just some consternation and concerns about the testing cadence and the cost. There's, there's a, a question about ESSER two, and, and oh, I think yeah. the question is around cash. Uh, it, um, it will follow uh, federal cash management uh, standards. So you would probably see like you're seeing this year, a 25% initial apportionment. And then everything after that, you would submit in your monthly federal cash uh, reports and be reimbursed based on those reports. Okay, one more just came in. Oh, that's Brooks, that's you. Uh, can schools use extended learning money for to contract with uh, community-based organizations to provide it, provide extended learning programs? Yeah, even if you, oh, Brooks, go ahead. Oh, go ahead, Mike. I was gonna say, if you even go back to the slide on that, uh, I think you would find that that fits in to a number of categories within the program in the existing trailer bill um, proposal. Um, again, you need to balance that with, with what you're providing. Okay. Tutoring, absolutely, there's no question. We had a whole federal program and state program built around those community-based organizations and tutoring, right? Um, and so, but direct instruction in the classroom, uh, again, you, you've got to, you know, there's credentialing requirements that don't just automatically get set aside that you have to keep in mind. And I think if I can, if I can chime in here, Mike, I think it's also important to emphasize and remind everyone that this is going to be part of, of every district's LCAP, what they, how they utilize these dollars. That's correct. Correct. Well, so, yeah. so, so in that, in that respect it needs to align with current. Before I leave, I want to quickly just tack on that real fast, because I, I think the, um, the folks who read Trailer Bill, I, some have, I think, construed it because it talks about being an addendum uh, to the LCAP to mean that everything tied into LCAP wouldn't necessarily apply to it. Uh, I can share that the intent of the provision is to have it serve as uh, a supplement, uh, much like the way the federal addendum does currently uh, to the LCAP, so it's a separate piece. Uh, and folks have asked about the timeline uh, because they've seen it's June, uh, even an earlier date had been uh, debated. Really, that's in large part because you will be, uh, in theory, if this gets enacted, you'd be using the funds in this year. Um, and so then, therefore, doing something for July 1 uh, doesn't really get to what you're doing with current year funds uh, that would be coming out in March. So we'll develop that template, but the idea is to keep it, uh, as Mike, if you referenced, keep it pretty, pretty clean um, and, and concise, uh, but it wouldn't be wrapped up in all other parts of the LCAP. It's yeah. an addendum. Yeah, and the trailer bill language specifically provides to Brooks point that you can spend the funds before you file that addendum. That's right. Okay. Well, with that, thank, thank you very much. Thank you, Brooks. Thank you, Mike. We appreciate it uh, very much. Look forward to the next time we connect. Um, and we know that you're busy and you don't have necessarily time to do this for everyone, but we do appreciate it that you did it did it for us. So thank you so much. You're very welcome. Good night, everybody. Thank you, Mike. You're welcome. Sorry for the problems. <laughs>